Chapter 7. Sheol, the place of the departed. In dealing with this subject, which is so closely connected with the Rephaim, it is inevitable that there should be some little repetition in the matter of references to passages from the Old Testament. But we think it is better to give references and quotations, even at the risk of some repetition, than to be constantly referring the reader back to the preceding chapter. Before, however, coming to the Old Testament belief in Sheol, we shall briefly touch upon the Babylonian conceptions concerning the underworld. These will, we believe, be found to be both interesting and instructive. 1. Babylonian Conceptions Concerning the Underworld The varied information that has been preserved in the cuneiform inscriptions about what the Babylonians believed regarding the place of the departed must belong to different ages. This conception is forced upon one on account of the conflicting ideas and contradictory things that are told us in these ancient documents about the underworld. The Babylonians believed in special gods of the underworld. They were subordinate to the great gods of the Babylonian pantheon, but they were nevertheless gods. The netherworld gods had their palace in the abode of the dead. Foremost among the rulers of the underworld was the goddess Irish Kigal, the mistress of the great place. She is also known as Alatu, the mighty one. Together with her is her husband, Durgal, called Lord of the Great Land. Their wedding is referred to in the Tel El Amarna tablets. The Sumerians, who lived in the country of the Babylonians before these latter drove them out, also had their ideas about the place of the departed. And the Babylonians evidently got from them some of these ideas. The Sumerians called the place of the departed Kurnugea, which means the land without return. And this name figures in Babylonian poetry. Thus, in the account of Ishtar's descent into the realm of the departed, this place is spoken of as the great abode, which whosoever enters never leaves again, the path from which there is no return. While this place is sometimes conceived of as a great hollow mountain, it is more usually thought of as an immense city which could not be measured for size. The way to it was across the ocean westward, towards the sinking sun, for it was situated beyond the waters that are beneath the earth. This great city of the dead is described as being enclosed by seven walls, and there are seven gates with ponderous bolts, and when a newcomer has entered one of these gates, the guardian who keeps watch by it closes it again and makes it secure with bolts and bars. It was, according to the Babylonians, a house of darkness, and they who lived there were shut out from the light. No ranks were recognized in that underworld. There all men were equal. And in that place of darkness, dust covers all things. Dust is upon bolt and bar, and dust covers the shades of men as they silently glide along the dust-laden streets of the city. The food of these weird inhabitants is dust, and black, murky water is their drink. In that place there is neither love nor hate, only sorrow and wailing. Monotonous moaning echoes along those streets of dust. That is the only sound in the surrounding silence, the only occupation of these dusty shades of men. The following, from The Descent of Ishtar, gives a graphic picture. Ishtar, the moon god's daughter, bethought her of the land without return. The land. The daughter of the moon god bethought her 
of the house of darkness, the abode of Urkala, of the house which whosoever enters never leaves again, of the path from which there is no return, of the house which whosoever enters is taken from the light, of the place where dust is their food and earth their nutriment, where they behold no light but dwell in darkness, where they are clad like birds in garments of wings, where dust is spread on door and bolt. But there is another side to the Babylonian conception of the abode of the dead, which is quite incompatible with those just spoken of. These also demand a little notice. In spite of the repeated emphasis laid on the fact that the dead enter a land from which there is no return, there are clear indications of a belief in the possibility of leaving it. Whether such indications are the expression of later and developed thought or not, does not greatly matter, since in any case they date from a time prior to the 7th century BC. The belief in the possibility of being able to bring up the spirits of the dead from the underworld, as the witch of Endor brought up Samuel, is a clear indication of the belief that the shades of the departed were not necessarily nor inexorably always confined to their abode. Further, this possibility is also indicated in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where we read of Ishtar entering the realm of the dead to seek the water which shall heal her lover. Elsewhere, in the same poem, Ishtar threatens to destroy the entire city of the dead, and to bring up all the dead on to the earth again, to associate with the living once more. Such conceptions, however quaint, and even if they were metaphorically employed, which may be doubted, or poetically, contain the idea that the realm of the dead was not necessarily a land without return although absence might only be temporary. But there was more than this in the Babylonian belief about the hereafter. Quote, Diogenes Laertes appears to have reported rightly when he credits the Chaldean schools of philosophy, better, schools of the priests, with a belief not only in immortality, but also with a certain kind of belief in resurrection. The Babylonian Noah, after having described the inevitability of death, speaks of the God of fate, to whom alone it has been granted to shield men from death. Close quote. For it is said in the Descent of Ishtar, already referred to, that there is, under the eternal palace, the Holy of Holies of the Underworld, a spring containing the water of life. This is guarded by the demons of the underworld, called the Anunnaki. This water can be obtained only by means of pronouncing a magic word known only to the god Ea. Here we have, though in a naive and quaint form, the idea expressed of the possibility of rising from the underworld, Further, we have in the annual Tammuz festival, also, both the idea of liberation from the realm of the dead, as well as that of resurrection. Quote, if scholars are right in deriving the name of Tammuz from a Sumerian phrase meaning true son, or, more fully, true son of the deep water, we must conclude that the Semites of Babylon took over the worship from their predecessors, the Sumerians. Be that as it may, we first meet with Tammuz in the religious literature of Babylon. He there appears as the youthful spouse or lover of Ishtar, the great mother goddess, the embodiment of the reproductive energies of nature. The references to their connection with each other in myth and ritual 
are both fragmentary and obscure. But we gather from them that every year Tammuz was believed to die, passing away from the cheerful earth to the gloomy subterranean world, and that every year his divine mistress journeyed in quest of him, to the land from which there is no returning to the house of darkness, where dust lies on door and bolt. During her absence, the passion of love ceased to operate. Men and beasts alike forgot to reproduce their kinds. All life was threatened with extinction. So intimately bound up with the goddess were the sexual functions of the whole animal kingdom that without her presence they could not be discharged. A messenger of the great god Ea was accordingly dispatched to rescue the goddess on whom so much depended. The stern queen of the infernal regions, Alatu, or Eresh Kigal by name, reluctantly allowed Ishtar to be sprinkled with the water of life and to depart, in company probably with her lover Tammuz, that the two might return together to the upper world, and that with their return all nature might revive. Laments for the departed Tammuz are contained in several Babylonian hymns, which liken him to plants that quickly fade. His death appears to have been annually mourned, to the shrill music of flutes, by men and women about midsummer, in the month named after him, the month of Tammuz. The dirges were seemingly chanted over an effigy of the dead god, which was washed with pure water, anointed with oil, and clad in a red robe, while the fumes of incense rose into the air, as if to stir his dormant senses by their pungent fragrance, and wake him from the sleep of death. Close quote. Although this myth, which, however, to the Babylonians meant a living reality, concerned the gods, one sees from it that there existed the belief in the possibility of release from the realm of the dead, provided the right remedy, the water of life, could be procured. The myth also contains the germs, at least, of a belief in resurrection. One other point in Babylonian belief must be referred to. The term awakeners from the dead is one applied to quite a number of Babylonian deities. Originally, this awakening had reference to the resurrection of nature, but the conception is also, at times, distinctly applied to man. Of the sun god Shamash, it is said, it is in thy power to make the dead alive, and to release those who are bound. The god Nebo is praised as being one who can lengthen the days of life, and who can awaken the dead. Of Marduk it is said that he is the merciful one who loves to awaken the dead. He is also called the awakener of the dead. Similar power is ascribed to his spouse, Gula. She is called the mistress, the awakener of the dead. Babylonian conceptions regarding the realm of the dead were thus varied and contradictory. Probably this is to be accounted for because of the illogical train of thought, which, on this subject, is to be found among so many ancient peoples. In part, it is also due, no doubt, to the amalgamation of conceptions belonging to different ages. Even when a development of thought has taken place, the old ideas are often impossible to eradicate. Upon the whole, Babylonian belief regarding the realm of the dead is gloomy and hopeless. But a brighter conception sometimes emerges and the hope of better things is contemplated. A word may here be added regarding the beliefs of the ancient Arabs about the departed and their condition. 
Very little, it is true, is known of these beliefs, because Mohammedanism has almost entirely obliterated them. But some remnants are left, which show that at one time the Arabs did not differ from the rest of the Semites in holding very definite conceptions about the departed. The cry which is uttered at graves, Be not far off, though officially declared to be useless, must be the echo of some real expression of belief, which at one time obtained, especially as it is known that the Arabs have all manner of ways of keeping up, as they believe, relationships with the departed. They furnish the dead with everything which he may require for his journey into the unknown land. They greet him when they visit his tomb, and even swear by his life. They believe that the departed, therefore, are alive, and that they have needs of various kinds. Water is believed to be one of their special needs, hence the custom of pouring water on graves. It is believed that the spirits of the departed appear in the forms of birds, especially owls, and that in this form they come to their graves and pour forth lamentations. They are also believed to inhabit cemeteries and desolate districts in the capacity of Jin. The belief is vague and undefined, but the conviction is there that the departed are living in some form or another. 2. The Old Testament Conceptions of Sheol As the Babylonians had their underworld, the Greeks their Hades, the Romans their Orcus, so too the Hebrews had their Sheol. The meaning of this word is still a matter of dispute among scholars. Some hold that it comes from the root meaning to ask, and that the word means the place of inquiry or scrutiny. In support of this, the story of the witch of Endor can be pointed to, for Saul comes to ask of Samuel, the inhabitant of Sheol, the information he desires. Assyrian scholars point out also that this is the meaning of the Assyrian equivalent to the Hebrew Sheol, viz. the place where oracles are obtained. Then the numerous references in the Old Testament to the practice of having recourse to the dead for help and guidance seem to support this theory. Moreover, in the later Egyptian belief, it is taught that the soul of the dead man after having gone through various vicissitudes, at last reaches the judgment hall of Osiris, where he undergoes an examination concerning his life while on earth, and where finally his heart is weighed in the balance of the goddess of justice. But this theory of the meaning of Sheol is too complex to have been primitive. It is quite possible that, as representing a development of ideas, it has a good deal to commend it. The ancient Israelite belief was, however, we imagine, of a much simpler character. There was, moreover, no differentiation until a much later, post-biblical, time between the good and the evil in the hereafter, such as is contemplated in Egyptian belief. A more widely accepted theory is that the word Sheol comes from the root meaning to be hollow, Sheol being conceived of as a great hollow place deep down under the earth. One recalls the Babylonian idea of the underworld as being a huge hollow mountain. This idea is a simple one, and it is that which commends it. For one expects simple ideas among a comparatively uncultured people, such as the ancient Hebrews were. As we have seen, Sheol was pictured as being situated under the earth. The earth itself being the abode of living men, 
the skies being the abode of the gods, as the stars showed, according to primitive ideas, there was no alternative other than that of conceiving the realm of the departed to be under the earth, or, more strictly, under the waters that are under the earth. Hence also the idea of the Babylonians that the journey to the underworld led by the way of the ocean, and this is implied when, in Job chapter 26, verse 6, it is said, the Rephaim tremble beneath the waters and the inhabitants thereof. Then again, it is taught that Sheol is a place from which there is no return. As the cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, so he that goeth down to Sheol shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. Job chapter 7 verses 9 and 10, compare chapter 10 verse 21. We have seen that the Babylonians called the realm of the departed the land without return. Further, the Babylonian conception of it as a great city with gates and bars is graphically illustrated in the Old Testament, where a similar conception is found. Thus, in the psalm of Hezekiah, Isaiah chapter 38, verse 10, the king says, In the noontide of my days I shall go into the gates of Sheol. And in Psalm 9, verse 13, where death is used as a synonym for Sheol, it is said, Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death. Compare Psalm 107, verse 18, Job chapter 38, verse 17. Its bars are spoken of in Job chapter 17, verse 16, where Job says of his hope, It shall go down to the bars of Sheol. This idea of Sheol being a city would have arisen very naturally, since it was in the cities that people were gathered together and that Sheol was conceived of as a place in which crowds assembled, comes clearly in Job chapter 30, verse 23. For I know that thou wilt bring me to death, to the house of assembly of all living. Compare Job chapter 17, verse 13. We recall in this connection the expressions gathered into his fathers, sleeping with his fathers gathered into his people. The idea of the realm of the dead being a city points to Babylon as its place of origin. For this idea was certainly held in Babylonia where the Israelites were still nomads. On the other hand, we get the idea of crowds in Sheol presented by a picture which would suit an agricultural people in Psalm 49 verse 14 conceivably an echo from ancient times, as a flock they are put into Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd. They shall go down to the grave with the upright. A different idea is expressed by the words, the snares of death, or the snares of Sheol. The revised version renders more literally and more correctly, the cords, the idea being that Sheol has the power of dragging men down. Psalm 18, verses 4 and 5. Again, the Babylonian realms of the dead seems to have its counterpart in the Hebrew conception. For, in Psalm 22, verse 15, it says, Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. And Psalm 30, verse 9 what profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? We are reminded of the words, Dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. Further, Sheol is a place of darkness. In, for example, Job chapter 10 verse 22, it is called the land of darkness, 
and in Psalm 143, verse 3, the psalmist's enemy is spoken of as one who hath made me dwell in dark places, as those that have been long dead. And in Psalm 49, verse 19, it is said, He shall go to the generation of his fathers, they shall never see the light. Compare the expression, the valley of the shadow of death, Psalm 23, verse 4. Sheol is also a place of silence. The dead praise not thee, Yahweh, neither they that go down into silence. Psalm 115, verse 17. Unless Yahweh had been my help, my soul had soon dwelt in silence. Psalm 94, verse 17. Compare Isaiah chapter 47, verse 5 and psalm thirty one verse seventeen let the wicked be ashamed let them be silent in sheol it is also the land of forgetting shall thy wonders be known in the dark and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness psalm eighty eight verse twelve sometimes we find sheol personified Thus, in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 14, it is depicted as an all-devouring monster. Therefore, Sheol hath enlarged her desire, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth among them descend into it. And in Psalm 141, verse 7, it says, our bones are scattered at the mouth of Sheol. Again, in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 18, Sheol is personified in the words, And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with Sheol shall not stand. Sheol is the ordinary word used in the Old Testament for the abode of the departed. But there are three other words, found only in late passages, which are sometimes used for this, as they express some of the latest ideas about the underworld before the development of belief began. A word or two on them will be useful. In Isaiah chapter 14 verse 15 occur the words, Yet thou shalt be brought down to Sheol, to the uttermost parts of the pit. In Psalm 88, verse 4, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. So too, in Psalm 28, verse 1, Psalm 30, verse 3, Psalm 143, verse 7, etc., where it is also used synonymously with Sheol. In Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 19, the curious expression occurs of going down to the stones of the pit. The thought is evidently that of the walls surrounding the city of the dead. Compare the Babylonian idea of the seven walls encircling the realm of the dead. Although this word is generally used as parallel with Sheol, it is possible that in the minds of the writers there existed the idea of its being a special spot in Sheol, reserved for the worst enemies of Yahweh. This is the impression gained especially from such passages as Ezekiel chapter 32 verses 23, 25, and 28 through 30. If this is so, then we are perhaps justified in seeing the beginnings of the idea of some differentiation between the dwellers in Sheol. The conception of a difference of condition there in accordance with what men's life on earth had been. It is at the most only a very slight adumbration of what was to come, but seeing that the word occurs only in comparatively late passages, there may be something in this idea. Then there is the word shalkat, which means corruption or destruction. 
It is used of the underworld in Isaiah chapter 38, verse 17. For thou hast kept my soul back from the corruption of non-existence. Again, in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 14, we read, And he shall not die going down to corruption. A very instructive passage is Job chapter 17, verses 13 through 16, which is worth quoting in full, as it so well illustrates the use and connotation of the word. If I look for Sheol as mine house, if I have spread my couch in the darkness, if I have said to corruption, shall cut, thou art my father, to the worm, thou art my mother and my sister, where then is my hope? And as for my hope, who shall see it? It shall go down to the bars of Sheol, where once there is rest in dust. In this passage, the full significance of the term is clearly brought out. It has reference to the decay of the body in the grave, but is used as a parallel to Sheol. Nothing could more graphically describe the hopeless condition in Sheol. The word occurs also in the passage already quoted, Psalm 30, verse 9. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to corruption? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Were it not for its parallelism with the dust, which is often synonymous with Sheol, one might say that Shakat referred to the grave only. In Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 8, it is said of Tyre, they shall bring thee down to corruption, and thou shalt die the death of them that are slain in the heart of the seas. And lastly, in Jonah chapter 2 verse 6, we have a case where the word is obviously meant for Sheol and nothing else. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars closed upon me for ever. Yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, Shakat, Yahweh, my God. These include all the passages in which Shakat is used of the underworld. It is clear that its use emphasizes the belief that Sheol is the end of all things for man. Finally, we have the word Abaddon, from the root meaning to perish, which further illustrates what was said about Shakat. It occurs only four times in the Old Testament. In Job chapter 26, verse 6, it is used as a parallel to Sheol. Sheol is naked before him, and Abaddon hath no covering. So too in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 11. It is personified in Job chapter 28, verse 22. Abaddon and death say. It occurs as a parallel to the grave in Psalm 88, verse 11. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? or thy faithfulness in Abaddon? These three words, then, which occur only in comparatively late passages, point to the high watermark of the official conception regarding the abode of the departed, reached before the development of doctrine began. 3. Sheol and the Rephaim it will thus be seen that the teaching on Sheol in the Old Testament is clear and consistent. If it could be separated from much that is said about those who dwell in Sheol, the whole subject would be fairly simple. But it is impossible to do this. We have seen that much that is said about the Rephaim cannot be reconciled with the doctrine of Sheol. And we shall see that this irreconcilability is emphasized by the conviction that the departed could be resorted to for help and counsel. We shall also see that there were some mourning customs which run entirely counter 
to the normal Sheol belief. We are thus led again to the conclusion, already formed with regard to the Rephaim, that the ancient Sheol belief underwent much modification in the interests of Yahweh worship. It was necessary to try to convince the people that there was nothing to hope for from the pantheons of men who went down to Sheol, for it was a land from which there was no return. Having once entered it, there was no possibility of emerging from it. They who were there were incapable of further action. There was an entire end to them so far as the living were concerned. The thoroughgoing way in which this point of view was inculcated has been illustrated. When we compare the Babylonian beliefs of the underworld and its inhabitants with those of the Old Testament, one or two interesting facts present themselves. The extraordinary similarity in many particulars suggests the likelihood of one system borrowing from the other, and as the highly cultured Babylonians were scarcely likely to have borrowed from an insignificant and despised little nation such as the Hebrews must have appeared to them, we must suppose that the borrowing was the other way round, and this is the more likely to have been the case in that we know the Israelites to have been much influenced by the Babylonians in other respects. Further, there is another interesting fact to consider. We have just seen, and the point is to be further illustrated, that the Old Testament doctrine of Sheol does not fit in with much that we read there about the departed. That is precisely the case with the Babylonian teaching about the realm of the dead, when compared with much that we read of the dead themselves. We know the reason of this, so far as the Israelites were concerned. May there not have been a cause in some sense analogous to this among the Babylonians? We are unable to say so definitely, but it is possible. Then, one last fact which is also one of interest. Taking the Babylonian doctrine of the departed and the abode of the dead as a whole, there seem to be, from the data we have gathered, three stages. There is the ancient belief represented by the story of the descent of Ishtar, according to which the distinct possibility is recognized of those who enter the realm of the dead being able to emerge from it. This will be more fully illustrated when we deal with necromancy among the Babylonians. This would correspond with the popular belief of the Israelites, which had existed from time immemorial. Then there is the stage in which the realm of the dead is described as the land without return, dark, silent, and dusty and this corresponds with the normal Sheol doctrine of the Israelites. Among both peoples there is an overlapping of these stages, resulting in the incompatibilities referred to above. Finally, there is a third stage in which there are distinct adumbrations of a resurrection doctrine, represented by the idea of awakeners from the dead. This is clearly a development. The Old Testament presents us with a similar development of doctrine, as we shall see in chapter 13. End of chapter 7